Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and I'm blessed to be here with you. During today's gathering of Mamas in Spirit, we will be exploring love. We will consider the true meaning of love and how loving people requires all of ourselves and sometimes even more than we think we are capable of. By opening our hearts to God, God blesses us with what we need to love and helps us return to loving and being loved time and time again. And please, it would be wonderful if you could take a moment to share this message of love with others by reviewing, subscribing to, and sharing Mamas in Spirit with others. Hello and welcome to this gathering of Mamas in Spirit. Today is a particularly fascinating day and interview for Mamas in Spirit because I have invited my husband, Brian, to be with us. Finally. (laughs) He's jealous. He's jealous. (laughs) I'm really excited and I feel like a rock star with these awesome headphones on. I'm excited for you, Brian. And everyone knows, including Brian, that I'm all about authenticity, so I find it kind of hilarious that trying to get here and do this interview is a hot mess and you can probably hear our children in the background at least two of them and it symbolizes love it does this beautiful mess and when they come in and interrupt that'll be part of the whole awesomeness of this recording it will, we're just going to keep rolling it will be and i have chosen to release this podcast on valentine's day in order to hopefully help point us all towards a much fuller understanding of love and what love truly is. And I think that is incredibly symbolic on Valentine's Day because Valentine's Day, even though it originated from a saint that my understanding is was a martyr and sacrificed his life for his faith and for what he believed in, it's become this very surfacey, almost merely romantic-based holiday. Highly commercialized. Highly commercialized. That's a good way to put it, Brian. And so we hope during this podcast to get into, like the words I said before, this beautiful mess of love. And I took that little saying from a girlfriend who recently did a retreat talk and I believe she named it a beautiful mess and I love that. Brian, I Lindy. hope I know you after almost we will be nearing 20 years of marriage in the next year and a half here. So hopefully I know you relatively well. I hope so too. Otherwise <laughs> we don't know what we're in for the next handful of years. Before you get to tell everyone else about you, let us begin in prayer. Dearest Lord, you are love. You are everything. Your love abounds when we open our hearts and trust in you and trust your work through one another. And I want to thank you and praise you for placing Brian in my life when I was merely 20 years old and in great need of the beautiful, messy, stable, committed, lifelong love that Brian offers me, which is a tremendous reflection of your love and one of the greatest loves I've ever known in my lifetime. So I pray today, Lord, that we can share that love of one another and a very full picture of love, your love, Lord, with everyone listening so that we can all leave today more ready to love and to share your love with the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I got to say, I think I've told you this recently, but I'm going to say it again. Since you mentioned something about me, I feel very blessed and honored on a daily basis and grateful that you chose me as your spouse. That's so nice. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I love you, babe. (laughs) I love you. Okay. So, Brian. Mm Mm-hmm. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about you and then also tie that into a little bit of us, like how we came to be as mere children. Good thinking. Well, I'm currently 43 years old. I don't have as much hair as I used to have when I was younger and you met me when I was closer to my prime, 
which would have been around age 21, and you were 20. And we met in college, and we got married about a year and change after that. Work-wise, I've worked in nonprofits and then went to for-profits. I worked in automotive marketing for a little bit, and I've been in real estate for the past 14 years or so. And I feel blessed the way everything's gone. I work with my dad and my uncle, so that's a blessing also. About us, we met when I was a junior, but we got together as a couple halfway through my senior year, which would have been your junior year, and I had not expected anybody to come into my life romantically, and I was getting ready to move to Texas, which I still did, which was, if I could go back, may change that a little bit, but that's another story. So that really changed my life in a huge way, because we ended up obviously getting married. It worked out. Everyone has messy pieces of their life. Oh, yeah, story. yeah. It's always fun to talk to couples because I found that we're not alone in having some stuff you could still poke each other on. And that we enjoy poking each other on <laughs> yeah. many years later. <laughs> yeah. Your listeners already know about our children, right? Yes. Our three wonderful adopted children. Yes. What I want to add to that, because like I pointed to, Valentine's Day is often a day that's focused more on this very surfacey romantic love. And really, what am I going to get out of this day? Or what is someone going to do for me than me truly giving of myself and sharing love with the world? And how beautiful that oftentimes we receive profound love in return for that. And I think that's really one of the things at the heart of our message today Mm -hmm. is that When I met you, you were different than anyone I had ever dated. I had gone for the romantic love and very much like roller coaster rides. So you're saying I was boring? (laughs) (laughs) Gosh. (laughs) And when I met... I had a motorcycle when you met me, so I wasn't that boring. Oh my gosh. So when I met you, you were so different and you were so good and centered and filled with character and faith, my greatest thing that I remember is wanting to spend time with you. I really enjoyed being around you and I was intrigued by you and who you were at such a young age. And I think that's why we were able to make the commitment that we did at 23 and 24 years old when we got married is because God blessed you with such a strong centered sense of who you were at such a young age. And I have to be honest with you, I wasn't as centered as you when we met. And I remember thinking that you were too good for me in a sense that how could I be deserving of this young man and this love that was so stable and so good and so different, such an expression of God's love. And I remember my roommates at the time, who I loved so much my junior year of college, really encouraging me to date you. I remember. Good for them. <laughs> I, I remember. Them a of gratitude. Brian loves telling the story that he would invite all these different people to go to these outings, like whether it was like to ice skating or to movies or whatnot. And I would be the one that would always show. Yeah. And the funny thing is. Oh, this is funny. That sometimes, usually if I invited people, there'd be like some people that came. Occasionally, it would be just Lindy. And I found out later that some people already had an indication or they were actually thought we were dating because sometimes you would just be coming. I'm like, all right. And, and then Lindy, we'd go always, show up. Yeah. I would I, show up with as your friend to things with other people. Yeah. yeah. But yet we were not dating yet. Well, you, you were a wonderful young woman, too. That's nice. You were very much, looking back at it now, if I were to characterize it, you were very much like a diamond in the rough. You were so eagerly seeking God, if I look back at it now, in a very raw and passionate way. And that alone was very attractive. And by the way, Lindy's very pretty. And guys liked her because you were very friendly. And so when she was friendly with me, I thought, oh, she's just being friendly. Your friends Initially. knew better. Yeah, my friends did know better. <laughs> they but, tried um, to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was a good experience. I mean, I'm thankful for that. And I'm also thankful that we were able to come together as a couple at such a young age. I feel like that was a big blessing. And it really catapulted us into our life, especially with our kids, having energy to deal with stuff. Because our I life... that's a blessing. Yes, and because our life has kind of been a hot, wonderful mess. Brian likes how I like to call things a hot mess. He's it's like, okay. why is everything so hot? <laughs> 
It makes things Somehow really exciting whenever it, it's hot. Some, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but one very important piece of our dating puzzle is that, and I hope it's okay that I say this, Brian, is that right before we started dating, went on a service immersion trip together to Tijuana for a week. And mind you, all the ladies listening out there, we did not shower for a week. That was part of the experience. And Brian asked me out right after we got back from this experience. So I was like, clearly well, I need to showered. date this You guy. had showered by that point. By the time you asked me out. But I was like, wow, you just spent a week with me, you know? I was like a total mess. And then you still asked me out. That was really sweet. But I bring up that service immersion trip because one of the pieces there was that we visited an orphanage, an orphanage I ended up returning to for a summer in between my junior and senior year to teach and play and be with the children and live in a community of six women. And I bring that up because Brian and I had a very strong calling to adoption before, long before we ever got married. And... Brian, I'm going to share a little piece of your story. Brian has... Or I can share this Yeah, if why like. don't you share this? <laughs> I um, don't need to steal your thunder. Well, this, and this is... <laughs> well, because this is a real life-defining moment for me. Even now at, at, you know, 43 years old, I look back. When I was 20, I was diagnosed with this rare vasculitis disease. And they had a treatment for it, but it was pretty aggressive. Really high levels of steroids. Not anabolic steroids, but prednisone and chemotherapy simultaneously. And it was it just lit me up. And I looked a lot different and I felt horrible. Although Lindy did not know me during this time. But however, one of the really interesting and life-changing things that happened was while I was being described by the doctor, they're telling me about this course of treatment and the chemo component and what the likely effects that would have on my ability to father children later on. And I was 20 years old. I'm just kind of like, oh my gosh. Like I had been tr- supposed to go to Ireland for a year abroad. So it went from, okay, now you're not gonna be able to go to Ireland. Then it's like, well, now you're not gonna be able to go back to school. And so it was kind of a depressing time, but there's lots of experiences of love here. But what to get to the point of what we were talking about, I'd shared this with a few people, the fact that I was gonna be going on this treatment and it would affect my ability to have children, most likely, or very likely. And I got a lot of interesting responses, but there was really one that counted the most. And it was from someone I would have not expected it from, but it was a buddy of mine. His name is John. And I told him about this and he just, without missing a beat, he just says, you know, it's okay, Bri. He says, you know, there's lots of kids who need homes. And that was just awesome. Really just, it made me feel better, like instantly, like in a heartbeat. That's a gift. That's a sign of love to be on the subject matter. And then secondly, it sent me on a trajectory. And the ultimate irony is that he and his wife ended up adopting two children. And they had no idea at that point. I mean, it was his girlfriend at the time. And then, Lindy, you and I ended up adopting children. And I just think what a blessing, like a a prophetic message coming to me at such an opportune time that changed the course of things. So your listeners know, by the time I had met Lindy at age 21, I had spent well over a year rebuilding. I looked good again. I looked healthy and I had been working out and because before that I looked sick and I gained a lot of weight from the prednisone. I just looked sick. And this is before being relatively athletic. And so that was a big change. So anyway, by the time I met Lindy, I was back in shape and I wasn't taking it for granted. And I had also had this background of projecting forward in my life and what that would be like. And adoption was very much a component because I found that I not only gifted with this heart for adoption and a lot of it because of that seed that John planted, his message of that, you know, lots of kids need homes and also just looking at my life differently. And I think at least subconsciously, Linda, you were someone who was open to this type of stuff. And I knew that instinctively. I don't even think, I don't know how much we talked about it. We talked about it at some point, but I just knew that you had that same kind of heart and your listeners know too. I didn't know for sure at that point what was going to happen. So I didn't know for sure whether I'd be able to have children or not. But ultimately, I knew that I had that openness to adoption. And the idea was appealing to me. And I knew just relatively instinctively that that was something that we shared. And this is even before we probably explicitly even discussed it. So I think that was very much a blessing. I love how you said the thing about a shared heart. And when thinking about love and that being a start for us, the beginning of our relationship, there was a shared openness to God's love. 
And I think that unknowingly, even in some ways that we had an openness and an understanding that, that we weren't going to have a lot of control over what would unfold in our lives, but that we were open to God's love, which is really kind of tremendous and amazing and a work of God and the Holy Spirit at a young age, because that openness and that reopening for us time and time again has sustained us through our marriage Mm -hmm. and all the different peaks and valleys of our married life. Yeah. So Brian and I, obviously we ended up getting married at Mission Santa Clara, which was just such a beautiful gift. And I remember walking down that aisle to the bell choir because as a child, a friend's family had taken me to their Lutheran church with this beautiful bell choir. And for some reason, I just remember that as being just beautiful. And we started our married life and very quickly things became very difficult. There's a very short honeymoon stage there before one fateful morning when you were very sick. Yeah, this is my second illness. Yeah, I'm not, second actually, of many. If you look at me, I'm, I'm I'm pretty healthy right now. So it's, praise it's, God. Yeah, thank, praise praise God. God. But um, I have these series of my ass getting kicked and it's happened a few <laughs> times in my life. We can't say that yet. Yes, we can. <laughs> I can say that okay. of, of this, the, the, the progress goes like my ass gets kicked. I finally become extremely humbled. I become open to God and God lifts me up in a very special way and a little bit different each time. And us as a couple too, it's very hard. I got to say though, as part of love is by myself, meaning you know, before I was married versus being married, it was so difficult to drag you through my mud. I mean, it wasn't my choice. But it was so difficult to watch you suffer because of something that was happening to me. This was a different illness that has since been handled. It had to do with seizures and stuff. It was pretty exciting. Just seizures and, and stuff. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. I, Gosh. I was working in the automotive field. I lost my license for six months. It was like, it was just a disaster. But anyway, the, the other point I want to mention is that I got sick again with a relapse of the original illness I had when I was 20. And that one really kicked my butt. I was pretty sick. I was pretty sick. You were, we were very and we were sick. married. And again, it was that same thing. It's like, go through the process, six months to starting to get to remission, and then a year of rebuilding. That's kind of like the same thing. So there was a blessing in this, though, a blessing in the messiness. As a good example of the messiness is prior to this, family and friends and stuff, when I would talk about adoption, they'd say, well, why don't you try all these different methods to have kids? And the, the truth was I had an openness for adoption. I felt like if I'm called to this, if I'm open to this, there are kids who need, need homes. I want to step up to that call. I want to step up. I think this is a blessing of messiness too, is learning to lean into like the grittiness of life. I think there's a blessing of that. This thing I learned to lean into it. We, and we did it together. So my thoughts were, I'm open to this. However, other people were kept on suggesting that we try other methods or suggesting that adoption was like the third rate choice. But I'd be like, no, that's my first choice. They didn't understand. The blessing was when I got sick that second time, I lost all my hair. I gained 50 pounds and looked terrible, totally bald. And nobody questioned after that when we adopted. Nobody said a thing because everybody just, they saw what happened. So that was kind of a blessing. It was like a complete green light and nobody else was going to try to hold us back after that. And that's a great example of rising out of the mess, mm-hmm. especially towards a greater good. And if you think about it, with our first two children who were adopted, a slightly older, difficult situation, also a very messy situation, is that we were young and kind of gung-ho. I was healthy, and we had a lot of energy, and so we were able to really pony up. In fact, looking back at it now, it's like we talked about at this age, it's just not the same. We were able to provide the energy needed to fulfill that task and that call. Yes, yes. And we have learned so much about love. It's almost difficult to articulate because it's so profound, meaning there's something about the fall, falling together into a mess, and really a lot of messes that we had no control over time and time again, whether it had to do with your illness or different things that have come up with the children that have been incredibly trying but there's something so beautiful about 
having no control over the fall and then just merely choosing God and choosing to just hang in there, even if sometimes it felt like by a thread and allowing God to help us rise again. It has honestly, honestly, Brian, it has astounded me, astounded me at times. I never could have imagined sometimes what the coming back together would be like or what the rise would be like, meaning the rise always came and always seems to come from a place of vulnerability and honesty and where you have been the truest or one of the truest reflections of love to me in my life is that you were always still there, so solid, so consistent. Like even if you had these like physical weaknesses for a lack of a better word, like meaning you had no control over them and you were just so sick, like your body was so weak, you're like your spirit and your soul and your sense of fortitude and your sense of grit and hanging in there has always been so strong and it has carried me. It has been an expression of God's love to me and surprised me in a sense time and time again in a wondrous way. Like, and not wondrous, it's more like wonder. I just heard a priest speak at my mom's group and he talked about wondering like to ponder God and to wonder like to wonder about God's goodness it more reminds me of the way that you like will look at me sometimes or hug me sometimes or and it's just the love is so real and it's not that romantic notion of love at all it's not like some romantic dinner date it's not like we fix it all by going out to some date with candlelight and whatnot it's this really raw beautiful cozy love that I I did not know. I mean, it's just remarkable. I've had this discussion with other adults. I was surprised I had to have the discussion with, but as part of when I was sick, I had a personality change because I was on these meds. I had really high doses of steroids, like really high doses of steroids. And it made me nuts. It made me freaking nuts. I couldn't sleep. And I finally learned to try to kind of like harness that insane amount of energy but then I'd crash too because I was on chemo. It was a horrible roller coaster ride. But the reason I mention that is that you displayed a lot of exceptional grace for enduring all that because nobody signs up to something and then some have someone legitimately have like their brain chemistry in a major way altered. And by the way, just for me, I knew I'm like, okay, this is especially going through it for a second time. I knew what it was like and getting off the meds. It's like, Life was so much easier so quickly when I started to taper down. It was a long process. With prednisone, you have to taper down. So it would take months to get off that stuff. But you exhibited a a tremendous amount of grace. And I know there were a lot of struggles by standing by me. I didn't look healthy. Like you said, I smelled like Windex from the chemo. You endured a lot. You were so graceful and that you stood by me. And that, that makes my allegiance to you all the more stronger. So I'm always, I'm eternally grateful for you for that. And it was so hard at the time, too, because I was just trying to survive. So to watch you suffer was just, it felt like another burden. But that just goes with a relationship. You love someone, people love each other. It's like a parent and the child. They're going to hurt when their child's hurting. The child doesn't have any say in that. They're just going to. And we went through that together. So I owe you a huge debt of gratitude. It's a perpetual thing. And you're my family. Like, I love you. Like, people who have a kid, and I, this is what I was going to say, is someone, if you have a child, you love your child, even if they do something crazy, you still, you might be angry at them, but you always love them. And that's one of those almost things that's frustrating because you can't detach. There's a song by The Fray called Cable Car, and there's this lyric that says, let's rearrange. I wish you were a stranger. I could disengage. And I totally, that resonates with me because we're struggling. I wish I could just break off like you are just some other person. But he's talking about his brother and his love for his brother is his family. So he just can't. You just, it's ingrained and it's part of that. But that's also the gift. And so the resurgence out of that, and hopefully with God's grace, there's a way to resurge out of that because I know some people that doesn't always happen. But there's a gift there that you can see the grace of God in real time, in real life. It's like almost like near perfection 
when you're able to emerge out of that and that bond that you continue to share it with each other and you've been all different places with each other. I mean, time and experience lends a lot to this. And some people maybe have it easier during different stages, but we're all affected at some point. Nobody goes unscathed through life. You don't get to just skip through and think I'm never going to get hurt. I mean, it just, it's going to happen. So everyone experiences it. So I hope, especially for younger listeners to know this, like their the ability to hang on. That doesn't mean to stay in like an abusive relationship or anything like that. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just trying to say that the reality of love with someone who's worth loving if you're choosing to go into it. And once you've made that commitment, you're like there or family, like a kid, you're just not going to be able to just say, just disengage as a parent. Our instincts run completely contrary to that. We're connected, interwoven. The fabric is tied there. Yes. And I love how you're touching on how hard love can be. It can be incredibly hard and it can test us beyond what we even thought were our human limits. Like I remember a specific day we got a phone call from Henry's school and long story short, they were concerned that Henry had hallucinated Mm -hmm. in middle school. Yeah, I remember this. And I remember we went and got him, we brought him home and we were trying to figure out how to proceed and how to move forward. And I remember that is probably the only time in all the years with the children and all the different positions we've been in and situations of advocating for them that I really felt like I had no idea what the heck to do at that point. Like I had no idea. I was at such a loss and I was totally like empty in the sense that I just didn't even know what to do. And I remember turning to you and being like, Brian, I have no idea what to do this time. Like I really don't know. I, I've got nothing in me right now. Can you please take the reins on this one? And you totally did. You totally did. You called your sister right away. She pointed us to someone. Thank you, Maria. And then mm-hmm. that person pointed us to a program at UCLA. Then we went to UCLA that turned into going to a regional center and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But my point just is, is that love accompanies. And it's interesting how... When one is weak, the other is strong. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you mentioned to me, I should give the background, is that Henry had said to me at more than one occasion, he's like, nobody helps me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? you got more resources. I've seen more things. We've, we've put everything we possibly could into you. The school's doing it. We've made sure. We've gotten tutors. We did everything we could do. And I was frustrated. I'm like, gosh, we've done all this. And you had told me something that I still reflect back on and use and pull up out of the memory file because it's so applicable and so many different areas of life, including work. But you had said, we could never control the outcome. We could only control what we put in. And we put out everything that we possibly could. We can't control the outcome. But that was our way of loving. We've done everything we possibly could. It kind of reminds me if you've ever done a sport or if you're doing something that requires a lot of energy. Like when I rode crew, I remember I did these erg tests to see how fast you could row. Then they were timed. There was equivalent distance on a computer. When I went hard enough, I remember getting off the erg once, standing up. My knees were locked. I tried to walk and I just fell because my legs were so depleted. But it was that same thing. You just leave everything that you possibly can. You contribute everything you can. I gave it everything I possibly could. Just in love, you just, you give everything you possibly can and more. And that's basically all you can contribute. We're unfortunately limited and we don't have control over everything, especially with raising children. There's no way to guarantee what the outcome will be. But you gave me that insight. And I think that's a really important thing to be mindful of for your listeners, because that applies in a lot of areas in life and so many different relationships, whether it's in a family with a sibling or a parent, or if you're parenting a child, or if you're a high schooler and you're trying to figure out something with a friend. And I, I want to be careful because there's healthy boundaries too, for especially for like kids and friends. But still, the principles there is like you can only do so much. There's a lot you can do, but that's the full extent you can go. And that's the love is the giving. It's not that it's going to come back. It's not that it's going to have a relative output that you would hope for, but it's that you put it all out there. 
Yes, thank you. I appreciate how you verbalize putting it all out there. And one of the things that has really amazed me in my life is how the tiniest things can refill me that I don't expect that come from me loving. Mm -hmm. I don't love for something in return. I love because I love and because I'm called to love. At the same time, when I am loved, it's deeply meaningful. And it amazes me, like for example, with our oldest, how it's been like love boot camp. (laughs) (laughs) And he, Henry, will do the smallest things that make the whole thing worthwhile, which astounds me. Like... Brian and I would show up at his school when he's a high schooler in the full inclusion special needs program, like for an IEP meeting or something else. And he would see us from across the way in the school and he would yell, mom and dad, he'd come running. He wants to introduce us to his friends. He's so proud of us and loves us so much. You know, God shows God's glorious self and God's love sometimes in the smallest of ways, but that's just what we need to continue and to keep going and even sometimes to keep trudging forward through many circumstances. Yeah. So Brian, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Anytime, Lindy. And is there- I'm around every day. (laughs) Is there anything else that you want to share with listeners? Love is such a huge topic. And we talked about this before. It's like, how do you cover this in like one segment? Because there's so many different types of love stages, places. There's so much that goes into it. And I really hope that your listeners are able to find something that applies to their life. We talked a lot about our experience, but I really hope that wherever they are in their life, that they're able to find something that they can pull from to help them especially those people who are feeling disheartened for whatever reason. It's hard, especially if they're older and they want to meet someone or if they're younger and really want just a friend they can rely on. That yearning is totally understandable. And I got to say, I've been there. I mean, take heart for me, staying close to God or really working on that relationship helped to spill over into other relationships. And I think always remembering what you can put out there for somebody else so the thing about yourself, if you can focus on other people, it seems to, that seems to branch out into relationships and growth. Yes. So I guess that's the last thing I'd have to say. Yes. Thank you, Brian. And so as we close today, let us pray, dearest Lord, may we all grow in your holy love. May we all grow to know you better. May we all open our hearts in complete vulnerability to you, Lord, because we are safe with you. And may this day and every day we grow a little bit closer to you and to knowing your eternal love in your name we pray amen amen thank you so much for joining us today as we've explored love you can find mamas in spirit on social media and i specifically want to point out pinterest today because i've been creating boards to help encourage you exactly where you're at in your life and what you may need right now And you can also go to mamasinspirit.com to find many reflective resources to accompany these podcasts. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.